<coughs> uh, kind of to recap from last time, last couple classes, we were looking at uh, figures like, we looked at this figure for a while and, um, and thought about what this particular motor cortex neuron is encoding. Um, and it seems to be encoding roughly sort of up to the left or, or leftish kind of movement. Um, so um, when the monkey wants to move left, this neuron increases its firing. When the monkey wants to move right, this neuron decreases its firing. Um, when the monkey wants to move its arm up or down, this neuron doesn't change at all. And so it's, you can sort of think of it as like pulling, <coughs> pulling the monkey's arm to the left with its firing, um, or as it relaxes its firing rate, the monkey's arm can, is allowed to move to the right. Um, and this is, of course, one of several thousand neurons in motor cortex. Uh, and others of those neurons will encode information um, in terms of uh, an in, in, in increased uh, desire to go up or down, um, or other neurons will increase their firing rate for right or increase their firing rate for left. Actually, sorry, I just realized that this thing might not be pointed at the right spot. So, just, yeah. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, so, um, so that's kind of what we were talking about a little bit on Monday and then into Tuesday. Uh, and then we imagined on Tuesday a couple of different neurons. Um, uh, and these different neurons have different preferences. Uh, and I think that this is maybe a little bit different, but what, we had, uh, what I have here is um, what, the way these are drawn is that this thing in the middle is the baseline, so for no movement. When the monkey doesn't want to move at all, the, fire, the neuron's just ticking away at two hertz. As if the monkey wants to move up, this neuron's going to fire, um, especially for upward, directly upward movement, a little bit less for diagonal movements, um, doesn't care so much about left-right movement, uh, and then decreases its firing rate for down. And then neuron A is similar, except that its preferred direction for movement is to the right. Um, yesterday, we talked about um, a situation that's a little bit more realistic than what I've drawn up here. Um, and that, that more realistic situation is that, in fact, neurons don't just have these sort of like clockwork perfect firing rates. Um, but at, in any of these, I, this is sort of, this is maybe the mean firing rate for up and to the rightward movement. But sometimes it might go as fast as 6 hertz or 7 hertz or even 8 hertz this way. The mean for this might, uh, is 6 hertz, but maybe sometimes it goes 10 hertz. Other times it just does, it stays at 2 hertz. Um, and so there's, an, there's actually a range of firing rates surrounding this mean here. Um, for the first part of today, we're going to ignore those, that, that, that issue that there's a range of firing rates, um, but I introduced it last time um, to, um, to reinforce the idea that there's uncertainty in neurons, to reinforce the idea that neurons are sort of um, poor in terms of their reliability of encoding of stimuli. Um, and so here, yeah, so for here we're going to do, so we've got this sort of simplified down situation that we're looking at. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so when you do, when you actually want to get a monkey to move a robotic arm, like those videos that I showed before, um, or if you just want to get the, the monkey to, um, where'd it go, to move this cursor around. You don't just record from two neurons to get the monkey to move this cursor around. Um, you record from uh, typically between 50 and 200 neurons. Um, you implant a cup, uh, about 100 little electrodes in the monkey's brain, and each of those electrodes, um, some of them might not pick up any neurons, some of them might pick up one or two neurons, um, and so you get some variable amount of neurons that you're, that you're collecting data from. And so um, that Having, having a large number helps to deal with that issue of noise that we were dealing with last class period, um, where we had some degree of certainty about which direction the monkey wanted to move based off of two neurons, um, but, not, um, but, but by no means perfect certainty. Um, so yeah, so what questions do people still have left over about what we did last time or about what the heck these circular diagrams are supposed to represent. Um, anything at all still uh, unclear about what, with that? Uh, 
Um, okay, and so one other issue that we discussed last time as well relates to what we, so what we did was, what we used was um, by hand, we did a Bayesian classifier, which means that we are going to take into account the known, we are, so before we even started telling the monkey to move this around, we, to move a cursor around, we recorded when the monkey makes natural arm movements, what its motor cortex neurons are doing. And so from that previous knowledge, we had some known relationship of the probability of getting a response um, in neuron A given, um, a, uh, given a particular intended direction. And we had a whole, for neuron A, we knew for all of the different intended movement directions, we knew what the probability of each response was, and that was what I wrote out on that circle in the more complicated version before, where it was something like, um, for this direction, there was a 25% chance that the neuron would be firing at uh, 5 hertz, and a, um, and a 50% chance it's firing at 4 hertz, and a 25% chance it's firing at 3 hertz. Um, and so we had this sort of known relationship between this. Um, we had no prior knowledge about which of the eight directions. At, so, so we've worked that out first. Then we say, okay, now monkey, you go move the cursor. We have no prior knowledge about which of the um, eight directions the monkey's going to want to move this time. Um, and, so, uh, and so instead we had, um, uh, we had sort of our prior uh, probability of up was 1 eighth, 0 0.125, and same for all of the different directions. Um, and then knowing this and knowing this, um, you can calculate, although it's just kind of a pain in the butt, you can calculate the prior um, probability of a particular response in neuron A um, is not terribly interesting to calculate, but you can do it. Um, and, then, um, and then what you can do is say, okay, well, I just got some response in neuron A. Oh, sorry. At some moment in time, I just got some response in neuron A. What is the probability of a particular direction given what I just learned about what neuron A is doing right now? Um, and so that is, we take into account all of these different um, uh, factors um, and multiply this times this, divide by that, and you get a probability for that. Do that again for all of the possible directions. And then you've got, um, and then you have a, um, a, 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 you have literally, if you do that, you have literally the best possible estimate of the intended direction. Um, which is a big advantage that a Bayesian classifier has. Um, that uh, in, if you want to do the best possible classification of any sensory neuron response or any motor cortex response, you want to use a Bayesian classifier. Um, and there are um, we did it for eight discrete targets. There are ways to even do it um, that get a little bit more computationally intense um, but are um, conceptually the same. Um, it involves including a little bit of calculus um, and you can actually then um, figure out uh, for any, uh, for continuously for any direction in the, uh, in the 360 degree circle where the monkey wants to move or you can extend it to targets or 360 degrees in three dimensions, or you can even extend it to more than three dimensions if you have the monkey moving an arm plus closing a pincher, or moving an arm plus moving five fingers independently. Um, it takes more and more neurons to get a reasonably accurate estimate of what's going on, but with the Bayesian classifier, you will always do as well as you possibly can given the information that you have about what all of those neurons are doing. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, um, so the Bayesian classifier is provably the best possible estimate, uh, best possible classifier 
Um, and, so, um, and so it's really the ideal way to do it. Um, but there's a significant drawback to the Bayesian classifier, which is that it is, um, it is slow and computationally intense. takes a lot of, um, I mean, we saw in a very simple case, and with two neurons, a computer can do it pretty trivially. It took us 10 minutes or so to work through it. Um, but with two neurons, a, neur a computer can do it pretty trivially. But if you have 100 neurons, and those 100 neurons have a huge range of firing rates, bigger than what I showed in the sort of practice example yesterday, then, um, then you're going to have um, a significant um, uh, a significant challenge where it's going to be a struggle for a computer to figure things out. And that's very important because if we want a monkey to be able to reach out and grab something and bring it to its mouth, or we want a person to be able to feed themselves because they've become paraplegic, or a person to be able to walk using um, artificial limbs if they've lost their limbs or, or, um, or, lost their, um, or lost the ability to move their limbs, then we don't want every time the person or monkey or whatever wants to move the hand, we don't want the computer to sit there spinning its little pinwheel circle for 10 seconds figuring out where the person wants to move. We want the movement to come within a tenth of a second of the person's intention. And so our Bayesian classifier is not going to work very well for us um, because it is too computationally intense to, to, to work through. Um, and so I may, be, I may be dating myself with this, but this reminds me of a particular um, Simpsons quote. So, here. Just There's three ways to do things. The right way, the wrong way, and the Max Power way. Isn't that the wrong way? Yeah, but faster. <laughs> so, anyway, um, the point of that being that the Bayesian classifier is the right way to do things. Um, and you can make fun of doing things the, the wrong way or the non-ideal way. But sometimes, faster is really very important. And when faster is really very important, then we are going to want to have some other way of figuring out how things are going to work. Um, and so, And so the way that we do that involves doing vector math, which is um, a kind of a new kind of math for this class, but it's actually fairly straightforward and fairly simple um, and uh, hopefully um, reasonably um, manageable to work through. So um, a vector is really just essentially an arrow. Um, and there are a variety of different ways that you can describe a vector, but essentially you describe a vector as having a, um, what we call a magnitude, or just, which, we just, which we represent by the length of the vector, and a direction. <clears throat> and there are, there are a few different choices you could make with how to convert firing rates. So instead of converting firing rates um, to, to probabilities and doing Bayes' theorem, which some people do use um, if they want to get things right and if they, have, um, if they can, uh, in, in this particular situation, um, do it reasonably quickly. Um, but, but more commonly, we use vectors because it ends up being computationally more straightforward. Um, and so. <clears throat> Um, for, a, for a particular neuron, so let's say for neuron B, um, we're going to convert whatever its firing rate at some time that we'll call time t. We're going to convert that into a vector. Um, and for neuron B, there, the, um, the direction that we're going to have our vector is always like highlight this in, in all the colors that I have um, because this is a point that often, often people get confused about. Um, the direction is always, always, always going to be 
just the preferred direction for neuron A. Uh, whoops, neuron B. For neuron B. So any vector I ever draw for neuron B always points up. Up is neuron B's preferred direction. I'm never going to draw, never going to take, a, I'm not going to ever have a red vector pointing this way. I'm never going to have a red vector pointing this way. I'm never going to have a red vector pointing like this or pointing like this. Nothing like that. The red vectors never, ever, ever look like that. They are always, 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 always up. That's neuron B's preferred direction. No matter what the firing rate of neuron B is, the vector points up. Um, so that's, that's, one, that's one of the two things that we need to know. The length is going to be equal to the firing rate at time t minus the baseline firing rate. So whatever neuron B's firing rate at rest happens to be. Um, and so, so, for example, um, and, and, then, and then, of course, so just to sort of continue this, um, neuron A is also going to get a vector. Um, and neuron A's vector, the direction um, is always at all times from now until the end of the universe, the direction of neuron A's vectors is going to point what, what point which way? Right. Yes. The direction is going to be to the right because neuron A's preferred direction is to the right. Um, and then at a particular time, at a particular time that we'll call time t, um, it has a length. So, so neuron A, you can sort of think of it as a vector that sort of grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks. So at any particular moment, the vector, well, at every time the vector's pointing right, but at any particular moment, the length of that vector depends on what the firing rate is. So it's sort of like this, this always horizontal, always right-facing line that's just getting growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking. So at time t, the length is going to equal um, uh, is going to equal um, the firing rate of neuron A at time t um, mi minus the baseline firing rate for neuron A. So, um, so. It's uh, shrinking and growing, shrinking and growing, but always pointing to the right. Um, and so to do an example of this, uh, actually, before I do an example, let me pause here. So what questions do people have about making these vectors? Yeah, sure. Do you end up having a negative length vector? Yeah, we'll direction? get to that. Yeah, yeah. So, the na so I mean, the, the neg that's a negative length vector. It's sort of like, okay, so this, if, if neuron, if, if, our baseline's 2 hertz. If the neuron goes down to 0 hertz, then what I do is I point myself to the right, because that's the way I always point, and then instead of walking forwards, I walk backwards. Um, so, so, you, so you can think of that as a rightward vector that has negative length, which is how I prefer to think of it. Um, but if you call it a leftward vector, you're not going to lose points. It's just that for me, it's easier to keep call it always right because because I really want to emphasize that. Like so, for example, um, at a particular moment in time, if neuron B is firing at four hertz and neuron A is firing at four hertz, people are often tempted to say, well, if neuron B is firing at four hertz, then I know we're either going here or here. Um, and so, and then we find out neuron A is firing 4 hertz, and so we say, okay, well now I know for sure we're going here. And so what they'll do on a problem is they'll have neuron B pointing like that, and then neuron A pointing like that, and look, I got the right direction. Um, and that's true, but that's not how we're getting to the right direction. That's not, that's not the computational method that we're using to get there. Um, and 
Um, and it's because the vector can't point in two directions with some uncertainty until you know about some other neuron. Um, and so that's why, that's, why those are, that's why those are mistakes. And so I prefer to just say it always points right, but they can have a negative length. And we'll, and we'll do some examples with negative length uh, in a bit. Yeah, what other questions do people have about that? Yeah, sure. Baseline firing rate is um, the firing rates on the on outside circle? It's the baseline firing rate is what's in the middle here. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, and, 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 um, and so I'll always either write it in the middle or on the, test, I'll, or on the test in the words on the problem, I'll say baseline firing rate for neuron A is blah. Um, <clears throat> and, so, uh, and so you'll always know that. And um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, other questions about that? Yeah, sure. For the first direction, right. um, is that the baseline firing rate of A or B? Or would you like the preferred, oh, um, oh yes, this is baseline firing rate of A and fire, or sorry, this is for neuron B, fire, is, it, is that, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, so so each neuron has its own baseline firing rate. For simplicity on problems, I always make the neurons interchangeable in terms of their baseline firing rate because that just makes life more confusing and doesn't really, it, it, just, it just allows for errors without really much learning to go on, so, um, so I just, that's kind of what I prefer. And so, um, and so what's written up there, it says, well, so a convert of, a neuron's firing rate at any moment in time can be converted into a vector with a direction and a length. The direction always represents the preferred direction um, uh, of that neuron. And the length represents a, an ever-changing number that is the difference between the firing rate um, for that neuron at a particular point in time minus the firing rate for the neuron when the, when the monkey's not doing anything in particular. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so um, let's work through a couple examples. So, um, so at time equals t, um, neuron, the firing rate for neuron A is 4 hertz. The firing rate <coughs> for neuron B is also 4 hertz. So how are we going to convert this into a vector? What's the vector going to look like for neuron A? First of all, what direction does it point? Uh, yeah, neuron A points right. So we've got a rightward pointing arrow. How long is it? Uh, two, right. Yeah, so we have a vector. So neuron A is a vector. Its length is two units of length, however long it is, two inches, whatever you want to use is fine. Um, okay, so that's, that's neuron A. Neuron B, firing rate's four hertz. What does that vector look like? Up, and it's two units, right? So you've got up, two units. Okay, so then, okay, so now we are back to our circle over here. And we start in the middle. And so we just put these two vectors onto our circle. So, start from our starting point, we go two to the right, then two up. And um, when you add vectors together, the way, it doesn't matter which order you do them, but um, you, add, you um, put the, you start with the tail of one vector at the starting point, then you go two to the right, and then st from that ending point is where you start your next vector going two up. And so our resulting vector is going to be this long. Uh, it's going to have the length of two times the square root of two, but I don't really care so much about that. Um, uh, the number, I don't care about. The sort of approximate size is, is going to be important, as we'll see in a second. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so there's, there's our question, there's our situation. And so what we will then deduce as a computer or as a person trying to figure out where this monkey wants to move is that the monkey wants to move up and to the right. And lucky for us, we got there. The monkey's got a reasonably quick movement going up there. There's a good length to this vector. Um, we're going in the right direction. This is exactly what the monkey uh, wants to do. So things are looking good. Any questions about that? So, at time 
It's the next letter after T, U. At time U, time equals U, the next moment in time. Um, now, our firing rate for neuron A is, uh, let's say our firing rate for neuron A is um, 1 hertz, and our firing rate for neuron B is also 1 hertz. So now, what's the vector for A? What direction does it point? Yeah, it points right, but negative. So I'm not going to take off points if you say it points left, but I prefer to think of it as pointing, as pointing right with the negative size. So we've got this, and the length of that is one unit. Then neuron B points up, but it's negative. So there we go, one unit. Um, OK, and so now, at this point in time, um, here, I'll draw it over here this point in time, starting in the middle. And it doesn't matter what order we add these in. So we can say, OK, we go down, 1. Then we go this way, 1. And OK, so things are looking reasonably good here. We have got, um, we're going the correct direction. Um, that's the way that the monkey wants to go, assuming that this is like a noise-free system, which is what we're doing for right now. Um, and uh, you know, maybe going a little, um, the, the, the length of this vector is also going to represent how quickly the movement is made by our cursor. And so maybe the monkey gets a little bit frustrated that the cursor is not moving as fast as it wants to, or the robotic arm's a little sluggish when it's trying to go in this direction. But at least we're going the right way. If there's some target over here, the monkey's going to eventually get there. So looking good so far, right? OK, so now it's time for. So now um, we're going to do a different one. Um, time equals W, next point in time. Um, I guess if I were a physicist, I would say T plus 1 and T plus 2, but whatever. Um, so firing rate of neuron A at this time is 1 hertz. Firing rate of neuron B at this point in time is 4 hertz. All right, and so the questions for this are where does the monkey want to go? That's a question that doesn't require any math. Um, what are the vectors? There are two of them. And then next is what direction does the monkey actually go? What direction does the cursor actually go? So let's take probably two or three minutes, find a group, do the, do the problem with this, figure out the vectors, and, and figure out what happens with that. Um, OK, so it's, probably, it's been a little more than two minutes, actually, but I think most groups have probably figured out. So, um, so first of all, where does the monkey want to go in this situation? Firing rate's 1 hertz, and firing rate be is 4 hertz. What's, what, what point on our circle maps out to that? Yeah, so our monkey's, our monkey's goal is here. That's where it wants to get to. Um, vector for neuron A, what's that going to be? Rightward. Rightward with a negative 1. So it goes like this, the length 1. Um, and then vector for neuron B, B always points up and uh, and it's and it's what length two yeah so two like this um, and so our sum vector goes like this and if we just sort of like extend that out we get somewhere sort of halfway between our target and over here so we missed our target so um, so you know where does the monkey actually go um, it go it goes to the, the the cursor or the robotic arm or whatever. Miss, the robotic arm misses the marshmallow and goes off a slightly different direction. The cursor misses the little target and goes off a slightly different way. Um, that's our vector, so that's the direction that we actually go. So we made a mistake. Um, OK, so um, the, the next question 
um, is um, try to come up with two to three solutions that will fix this. So, um, and in, if you want to, in one of those solutions, you can imagine recording more neurons. Um, but try to come up with, if possible, three different solutions, um, with, and at least two of those not involve just using what we have with these two neurons. That's the only information we're going to have, and we want to make an algorithm, a computer program that can hit our target given this, um, given these sort of constraints here, um, and or or also some other things that you can change around if you can think of anything else. So we'll have maybe about four minutes. Yeah. Um, okay. So it sounds like most of the groups have kind of quieted down. Um, so one solution that I heard several groups come up with here is to record more neurons. And there are a variety of different ways that recording more neurons might be helpful. We could imagine if we have some new neuron C that we get, and neuron C is like the mirror image of A. So again, it's 2 hertz. Over here now, it's got 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, 6, 4. Um, and then we also add in some other neuron, neuron D, that's sort of like our mirror image of uh, B was. So 2 hertz, um, do, 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 uh, oops, 0, 6, 4, 4, 2, 2, 1, 1. And if we do that, um, and you can work through um, all of those possibilities, if we do that, we're going to get our target for really any time. And this is a nice situation where as long as our neurons are, are not noisy, um, and in reality they are noisy, and we talked about that a little bit last time, and we'll return to it in a little while um, later today, um, but, but in this sort of perfect universe of our neurons not being noisy, with these four neurons, we will hit our target. Uh, did you have a question, Alex, or were you just kind of stretching? Okay, um, okay so that's one solution. Um, but let's say we don't do that. We're just stuck with A and B. Um, we know, just from looking at it without doing any math, we knew where the monkey wanted to go. But we want to build a computer that can figure out where the monkey wants to go. And also even, so if we back up here, Sometimes the target is directly above in one of these eight cardinal directions, but sometimes our target is actually off at an angle. So we're going to want something that does allow us continuous um, control of this cursor um, so that the monkey can move in any direction. Or alternatively, sometimes as the monkey's moving the cursor, it ends up um, a little bit off, it ends up sort of, yeah, like missing and then needing to correct. And sometimes that correction is not in one of those eight cardinal directions. So, so we want something that does have, one of the nice things about this vector math is it automatically gives us abilities to point anywhere in the circle. We're not restricted to one of those eight directions like we were with the Bayesian classifier. So we kind of want to preserve that. But, but nonetheless, we've got a problem here. We're missing our target. So what can we do, how can we reprogram our computer so that we can hit our target? What thoughts do people have about that? Sure, yeah. In this case, it just worked out that if you multiplied any negative number by uh, a 2, in this case, it works. But it might also just be that any negative number by the baseline. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's more by two, because the baseline firing rate is in hertz, and then you end up with hertz squared, which is like a weird unit for this. But yeah, um, so, but yeah, I mean, the, the, initial, the sort of core problem here is that these, is that decrease uh, firing rate um, is more meaningful um, is more important, is more significant then increased, or maybe a better way to say that is that, um, uh, so, so you know, one, one solution which is not possible in the universe that we live in, but would, but would be great, would be to come over here to neuron A and say, okay, you go 0 hertz, 0 hertz here, and then over here you go to negative 2 hertz. There's no such thing as negative 2 hertz. So, 
But then, but then we'd, have a, we'd, then we'd have a perfect situation where it goes up by 4, down by 4, life is good. Up by 2, uh, uh, down by 2, life is good. Everything would work. Um, that's not the universe we live in so, because there's no such thing as negative firing rates. So that's not going to work. But that's sort of the ideal is if we can figure out some way to, uh, oops, or another way to say that is our neuron has a sort of, it, it runs into this floor when it tries to decrease its firing rate. It, it has a limit to how much it can decrease its firing rate. And having a limit to how much it's decreasing its firing rate means that it can't encode firing rate changes linearly. Um, so another, or to say that a little bit more formally, we have assumed that firing rate changes are linear, but our neuron is nonlinear and firing rate decreases um, have a limit on how much we can encode them. And so we can solve this by creating a slightly different function here where we say the length of our vector is the firing rate of the, at the, in a particular point in time minus the baseline firing rate and then add in here a but if, um, if, the, um, if the length is negative then multiply by 2. Same thing over here. Um, and so if we do that, then we say, okay, neuron A, the length of our vector is negative, our vector points right, its length is negative 1, and then we say, oops, negative, multiply by 2, so draw this. And then neuron B, the length of our vector is, the vector points up, the length is plus 2, so we don't multiply by anything, we get this, and now, great, we're right on target going straight for where we want to go. We've got our monkey, got, got our target going right where we need to. What questions do people have about this? So, um, yeah. Um, when we multiply by two with a negative vector, now we are, we're changing the size of the resultant vector, right? Yeah, which is actually going to make it move faster. And that actually helps us. If you remember back to one of the earlier cases that we had, where we had, um, when, when we want to go, um, when we want to go this way, we get a nice long vector corresponding to moving quickly. And then before we made this adjustment, when we wanted to go the other way, we got a little dinky vector that went the right direction, but it wasn't moving as fast as the monkey wants it to go. And so by multiplying our negatives by 2, we're actually going to also solve that problem that we had before. Um, which is less significant because we're at least getting our target, but it is annoying for the monkey that we're going there slower than it wants. So, yeah, my question was, it's more important to get the right direction on those. I mean, ultimately you wanted the monkey to just be able to control this thing with its mind. And you want it to be able to move the arm as if the arm is its natural arm. And so you want, you want it to be so that the, the arm moves exactly as fast as the monkey wants, exactly in the direction the monkey wants. Um, if I had to choose, I would choose direction over speed. But honestly, you really want both. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions about that? OK. And so this, it, conceptually, this is what we have to do. Um, in practice, it, uh, the, the, the examples you're going to get are all, are all going to be along the lines of, what, of what's shown here. Um, in practice, it turns out that you, um, that you need to sort of for each neuron, figure out what the sort of nonlinearities it has are and correct for it. Um, but essentially what we're doing is, is we are correcting for the nonlinearities in our neuron. 
Um, and actually, I guess I should have given this a name before. So what, before we, when we don't do our correction, when we just look at this baseline firing rate versus other um, uh, versus um, versus actual firing rate, that's called a population vector average. Um, and the average is we, um, if you add a bunch of things together, which is what we did, add some vectors up, um, then you just divide. You sort of if you have 100 neurons, you don't want it to go 100 times as fast. So you, so you divide by how many neurons you've got so it, you keep everything in some sort of reasonable speed. Um, but so, so that's the sort of simple, that's our simple non-corrected. This is our non-corrected model. When we correct for the non-linearities, then we call it an optimized or optimal linear estimator. Still not as good as if we used a, Bayes, a Bayesian classifier, but this is rel also relatively simple, cheap, doesn't take, doesn't take much extra computational power to do, and we can, um, with many neurons, quickly add the vectors together and make corrections for the nonlinearities that those neurons have. So those are our two classifiers. And of the two, it seems like our optimal, optimized linear estimator is the better one because it's correcting for, because neurons have these inherent nonlinearities. A neuron typically has a relatively low firing rate. It can only slow down by so much before it gets to zero, but it has a lot of space to speed up. And so there's a lot more capacity to encode increases rather than decreases, and we can correct for that and get better predictions. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? Okay, so let's come back over here. So this is, this is looking at uh, if you have a population of 100 neurons, each having its own preferred direction. Um, the uh, average vector direction is the dotted line with an arrow on it, and each of these little lines represents the change in firing rate in that particular neuron when the monkey wants to move in one of these eight directions, and, um, and the length of that vector represents, um, um, represents the, uh, the, um, the change in firing rate for that neuron. Um, so this is for a population vector average algorithm. Um, you could readjust the negatives um, and, make, uh, and make an optimal linear estimator that will do a little bit better. But with enough neurons, so, so one question is, what's the advantage of using many neurons? Um, one obvious advantage of using many neurons is we're going to average out some of these nonlinearities if we have neurons that sort of equally style the whole 360 degrees. And so that will um, be an advantage. Um, one other issue that you might notice if you look carefully at this is that sometimes you get a neuron, this neuron, so this line here is a neuron that's preferred direction is sort of midway between straight down and down to the left. And it's got a really long line representing it. Um, and that means that that neuron is, um, uh, had a really big increase in firing rate. And if, that, if we were only recording from three neurons um, or five neurons or whatever, that one's going to be really dominating our, our vector that we get, our sort of sum vector or our average vector that we get because we've got this one neuron that's really going crazy. Um, and so with that in mind, why is it maybe also advantageous to have a lot of neurons instead of just a small number? Sure, yeah. If one of the neurons misfires and has a large, uh, like, or large increase in fire rate, then if there's a lot of neurons that, can, that misfire can be counteracted. Yeah, yeah, this sort of, yeah, I mean, you can see there's even some that, that have long lengths that, that tend to be more rightward preferring, and so they're sort of averaging each other out. Um, and so with enough neurons, we can average out those, um, those fluctuations. Um, w on the homework problem, with the exception of the one that asked you to work through what we did yesterday with the Bayesian classifier, um, you're going to see 
um, uh, cases where everything's like fixed and there's not variability. But I, but you should keep in mind that in reality there is variability, and so that's one reason why in reality we don't do this with three neurons or five neurons. We do it with forty or a hundred or something. Okay. Um, all right, so, so, so we've got now two classifier, two, two, well, three, the Bayesian classifier that's too slow for us for right now. Population vector average, uncorrected. Um, and that one worked okay, but it missed, uh, missed some targets, because, and the monkey was starting to get frustrated with it because um, negative firing, decreases in firing rate are not encoded as well as increases are. And so we came up with a slightly better algorithm called the optimal linear estimator. Um, or OLE. This one we call our PVA. And the optimal linear estimator solves that problem for us, seems to be a better choice. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so um, what other did, did any, what other ideas did people come up with for how we can fix this problem that we had? So going back to our population vector average, if we're not going to if we're not going to take this solution and um, and multiply all of our negative numbers by two to rescale them, is there anything else we can do that will help? Actually, um, Ashwini, you had one idea that I sort of said no to, and you also had an idea that I sort of said no to. What was the idea? Do you remember what it is I said no to? Uh, changing, the changing the baseline firing rate. Yeah. What in changing 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 some of the properties of the outside? Yeah. So um, so and I said that we can't like m exactly wave a magic wand and change the baseline firing rate, but let's sort of play with that for a little bit and pretend that we can wave a magic wand and change our baseline firing rate and see what we're going to get with that. So let's, uh, we'll get a magic wand out and get our magic wand ready and what we're going to do is reprogram neuron A and neuron B. So with our magic wands ready, Do okay. So you're going to change the baseline firing rate. Maybe make the baseline firing rate here four hertz. Give us a little bit more space, right? We were running into this problem where we couldn't slow down. We, we, there was only a limit to how much we can slow down. So change the baseline firing rate to four hertz. Um, and so this maybe this is still zero hertz. Maybe now this goes up by eight. So we still have an increase in four, decrease in four. Uh, maybe this is two. This is two. Doesn't care about left right still. So we're at four. Um, and then this is six, this is six. Um, and then with our magic wand, we do the same thing over here to this one. Um, this cell doesn't care so much about up down, its preferred direction was over here. Um, so now with our, with our magic wand, what we have done is before, we had some cells that were nonlinear. And, um, and what I mean by nonlinear is for some directions of movement, the vectors were large, and for others' directions of movement, the vectors were smaller. A linear neuron would have the same amount of increase for the right as decrease to the left. We didn't have that before, now we do. Um, so this would solve our problem. Um, and I encourage you to spend a little bit of time and convince yourself that this would solve our problem. And here, if we use our population vector average algorithm, without this correction, we don't need to worry about these corrections anymore, if we had this magic wand situation, then we would have, then everything would be great. And we could use our simple algorithm, and the monkey would always hit the target. And in fact, not only would the monkey always hit this target, but if the monkey wanted to get up here or wanted to go, you know, not quite at this point here, but just a little bit off, um, 
as long as the neuron is perfectly linear and we allow for any firing rates, um, even like half hertz and quarter hertz, which totally is, is physically possible, um, it, we, can, we will be able to hit any target we want anywhere on the circle without ever missing if, um, as long as we've just made our neuron linear like this. So that would be great, right, if we could make our neuron linear. Um, yeah? Not exactly. So, um, so it turns out that in reality, almost all of the neurons in motor cortex are nonlinear, like we saw before. But, um, but there is, there actually is a magic wand that will do this for us. And the magic wand is to do. Um, uh, so, so, com so this was a computational solution. Um, the the magic wand is to piss the monkey off for a little while. Um, and what we do is we plug the monkey into the system and we, and we just say, I don't care that your neurons are nonlinear. I'm going to assume that they are linear. And you're going to miss the target a lot. But we let the monkey watch the cursor move. And sometimes the cursor moves right where the monkey wants. Sometimes it's a little sluggish. Sometimes it misses. And the monkey gets a reward when it hits its target. So the monkey gets a little frustrated at times. And so we call, what we call this is we call this a closed loop system. Um, and what that means is, so open loop means we record from the neurons, then we figure out where the monkey cursor was, and we never show the monkey where we thought it wanted to go. We just record, and then we make up our mind about where it wanted to go. But we never close. Closing the loop means giving that information back to the monkey. In a cl so in an open loop situation, the monkey doesn't get that information back. It never sees where, where our computer thought it was trying to go. Um, in a closed loop situation, we've got this visual feedback. The monkey sees where we thought it was trying to go, where our stupid algorithm that assumed linearity, which is wrong, thought it was starting to go. And then the monkey sees itself making mistakes. And the amazing thing that happens um, when, a, you, when you do this is that the neurons will increase their, the monkey somehow manages to increase baseline firing rate of its neurons and take its neurons, which were for its entire life, nonlinear encoders, and it worked well enough for the monkey to move, and, it, and now it turns those neurons into linear decoders. So you, if, it, if it works with a linear decoder for a while, then it will reorganize, restructure the synapses, restructure the baseline firing rates of its neurons in its motor cortex so that the neurons now become linear decoders. Um, of uh, of these um, uh, of, of of these signals, and so uh, or so I guess encoders. The neurons become linear encoders, so that our linear decoder works well with it. Any questions about that? So I mean that is a very important point for the homework assignment for, that's due uh, on Friday, um, that, that, um, that you can, that if you give the monkey practice with, with, this, um, with, with this bad decoding algorithm, it will reorganize, re rewire, re add more sodium channels, whatever it needs to do to these neurons to make them become linear uh, encoders of information. Actually, one of the big things that's it's an open question that some of the researchers here at CMU are working on is trying to figure out how that happens. How, how, what, what goes on between the time the monkey's frustrated with this population vector algorithm to the time that it figures it out, such that it's now, we, we know that the neurons change their baseline firing rate. We know that they become more linear in the way they encode information. We don't know yet how, um, what, what changes happen in those neurons? Is it more sodium channels? Is it stronger synapses? Is, are some synapses stronger and some synapses weaker? We don't have any idea. Yeah. So what questions do people have about that idea? Kind of went over that quickly, but it's a fairly critical point for the homework. Yeah? They look and see like after, if they stop letting the monkey 
the task after some period of time? Do they readjust or do they kind of stay in the state for Yeah, so um, they, they do readjust. It's a lot like the barn owls were. So with the barn owls, you take the prisms off, they go back to, to, to um, one, so then you put the prisms back on, and then, and then they go back to turning their head a different way, and you take the prisms off, and they sort of have these two modes of operating that you've built in the brain. Um, same sort of thing happens here. And actually, um, so one of the slides here just is showing, so for, um, so if you have open loop, if the monkey doesn't see where you're moving, then a population vector average makes a lot of errors. Being high on this means that there's a lot of mistakes. The x-axis here is the number of neurons that you're recording from. More neurons means fewer mistakes um, because a lot of those errors can average out but you still make a lot of mistakes with the population vector average. With an optimized linear estimator where you correct for those nonlinearities, then you make fewer errors, um, but you can get as good as an optimal linear estimator if you just let the monkey play around with it and figure out how to linearize its neurons. Um, uh, there's another, so one of the papers that I posted on Blackboard describes this, has this figure in it. There's a whole other thing about bias that we're not going to go into today. We might have a little bit of time to talk about that tomorrow, um, but that's not necessary for the homework assignment. <clears throat> um, and so, um, kind of getting at Jack's question a little bit, what if, um, so if we train a monkey to use a PVA, the simple algorithm, then it gets really good at it, and it makes a lot of, and, and it will accurately move the cursor to targets. Um, these are just tracking the path that the cursor takes to get to targets. If we then switch it up and put it onto an OLE, which should have been the better thing in the first place, but we switch it up and put it on an OLE, and now it actually starts missing the targets because its neurons are assuming that it's going to be a, um, a population vector average, the neurons have made themselves linear, and now we're, now our computer has been told that the neurons are nonlinear. So the computer is not going to move the cursor the way the monkey wants. Alternatively, we can train the monkey with an OLE. It learns a little bit faster because we correct for the natural um, um, biases in the system. Um, but then if we switch it up to a PVA, the, the, the monkey starts making mistakes because, um, again, now, our, now our, um, our algorithm has accounted for the inherent nonlinearities and the monkey is now um, all of a sudden put into a different situation. If you give the monkey, what's well, not shown here, but if you give the monkey a little bit of time, and it really only takes about an hour or so to learn, if you give the monkey a little bit of time with a PVA, then you give it a little bit of time with an OLE, and then you start switching them up, within two or three times missing the trial, missing the target, the monkey will adjust um, and switch back to the new decoder. So just, again, just like the owls, whenever you, you, it will detect very quickly when you switch the decoder on it, and within a couple trials, it will switch and make its neurons nonlinear again. Because when you, put, when you put it on the OLE that assumes nonlinear neurons, then if you put it on a decoder that assumes linear neurons, within a couple misses, it figures out that its neurons need to be linear and switches back to, having, to, to linearizing its neurons. And so you, um, the, the monkey's brain, just like the owl's brain, learns these two different modes of operation um, and can quickly interchange between them. Yeah. I don't know. I, sus I, I I'm not sure. I think s that they have done things like that, and the monkeys usually res reserve it. I want to say that they, they do, but I'm not sure that people leave the monkeys sitting around not doing hardly anything for a while because monkeys are pretty expensive to take care of, and they want to get data out of them. So proposing an experiment where you're spending um, uh, uh, $80,000 um, to leave a monkey alone for a year. I'm not saying, like, leave it alone. Yeah. Either. Like yeah, if it, yeah, in that case, is yeah, yeah. So sometimes they switch up the tasks and start doing something else with the monkey, and then if they switch back, the monkey figures it out pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So it does that, yeah, in that sense, it does seem to last. Um, and so I didn't, when I showed this video before, um, I didn't um, uh, specify it's set up on the top, but I didn't specify this is actually using a population vector average. So the monkey has learned and practiced with the robotic arm enough that it has managed to do. Um, to do this very precise task, and its neurons are have already reprogrammed themselves to be linear to make that work. 
Um, okay, so I will let this can keep going for a minute. What other questions do people have? Any last questions people have about any of this? So that should be everything you need to be able to finish the homework that's due on Friday. Um, the papers are due today, and then um, review tonight. We've, what, 5 o'clock? Is that right? Yeah, 5 o'clock, up in the regular classroom. Tomorrow we'll be up in the regular classroom. The final exam is around the corner in 5303 from the regular classroom, and I'll be there from about 8.15 in the morning until somebody will be there from about 8.15 in the morning until about 5.30 in the evening on Friday. So um, you can take the test whenever you want. 